There you go. It's good to have everybody join us this evening. Thank you for taking the time. Just pray that I will be awake. And I'm sure I'll be awake. As I turned on with excitement to see what we have in our series of the Heroes of Faith. And I saw that today is the fate of Moses, Hebrews 11, 23 through 28. The Heroes of Faith, part five. <laughs> when I saw that it was Moses, I said, like I said, the same thing, my daughter and the uh, Dr. Sophia and goodness often say that's creepy. Kind of, I just came back from Egypt and uh, to see, I didn't plan it. Moses, talking about Moses of the Moses of the old in Egypt. That's creepy. But I thank God for the successful trip to both Dubai and uh, Egypt. Uh, particularly the trip to Egypt was uh, was uh, something else. Let me just put it that way. I have been for many, many years praying that the door would open for, for our ministry in Egypt. And uh, three years ago or so, actually four years ago, the Lord opened a door. This is my third trip. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, this is, was our third trip to Egypt. When you reach there, you just see history in the making and you're able to identify with the Bible, uh, the people of Egypt. They have a history of thousands of years uh, and they're still there because they are in God's program. They are in God's plan. Egypt will remain even until Christ returns. It is very much in the center of God's plan as well. The, the, uh, I told my sister, they be that uh, when I was in Dubai, that Dubai, no doubt, people say that Dubai is the center of the world. I can see why, because it connects. It connects the whole world. Dubai connects the whole world. Within, when I was in, a, in the hotel, within, within 48 hours, I have already been identified with uh, over a dozen people from different 12 countries already. And by the time I left, more countries were identified by coming in contact in the hotel alone. And uh, outside, when I go outside, I see people as, as well. Opportunity to witness. Thank God that I took uh, the, my witnessing tools and uh, they were not co confiscated at the airport. So everything I took with me made it both to Dubai and to Egypt. And, uh, and also the witnessing tools like the riding the train and who are you, they were translated in Arabic in Egypt, thousands of them. And they brought some to me to, be, to use in the hotel. The people, this last trip was was uh, very striking, striking in the sense that uh, everywhere we went, you can see that they were very open. Uh, they were very open to the teaching of the word, 
I don't know who has a picture. Shalom. Shalom. Yes, sir. You're you're front and center. Okay. I don't know who has the picture of the. We don't show pictures for distraction's sake. Yeah, that's. I, I can't change the. I don't know who tuned in with the picture. If. Uh, Okay, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. If you can, that's okay. In Egypt, the, the people who hosted me, we had the, all the meetings. They picked him up at one time, nine something in the morning and they, uh, almost nine something PM or it's almost nine o'clock, they brought me back to my hotel. Uh, the after the end at the end of the program they asked if I could stay a little longer. There was a, a pastor that uh, has over a thousand uh, members. He just heard that I, I was in town. He never met me before, but he came after the first meeting. He came to me and said, "Please, can you come to my people?" I said. Uh, uh, we already booked. And he said, can you come on Tuesday? I said, Tuesday is the, my time. I'll be flying back. He was just looking at me as, can't you check, change your date? <laughs> can't you change your schedule? I would really like you to come. I told him, next time I will make sure we put you on our schedule. He was delighted. And he attended the program until the program was there finished. Overall, I felt the, the connection between the people who attended and their anxiousness towards the truth of the word of God. They finally, it's like a light bulb went off. They saw that what I have been bringing to them or have brought to them within the, the last two years wasn't just my own word, but the word of God. They all describe it in so many ways. At the end of the program, we all met, the leaders we met to say goodbye and just have fellowship together. Each leader brought what their group was saying. All the people were respond. All their responses, they just kind of brought them all together when we had time to, to, to everybody to just express his or her uh, appreciation or what the individual gathered throughout the meeting. It, it, it was just, he uh, uh, put tears in my eyes as they all, it was just, it reminded me the time of the apostle Paul when he was at Ephesus and saying farewell address to them. And uh, I'm not going to repeat all the praises like I told my sister Debbie. The praises were personal, but personal in the sense that I know that it, it wasn't mine. I didn't do a thing. God was the one who walked behind the scene to make, to magnify his name. Indeed, he he, he really magnified his name throughout the program. People were very excited. Uh, I, I, it just, the only way you can identify is if you could have been there yourself. That's the only way you'll be able to know what I'm trying to explain. I'm not a reporter. That has been my weak point when it comes to reporting the work that I did on the mission field. In the past, I have not been doing that. I, it took me time before I even gave my board of directors, uh, board of uh, AG, uh, took me time to even give them a first report. I, they always say, Moses, give us pictures. I said, I don't take pictures. They even bought me a camera. I said, Moses, when you go next time, take pictures. I say, they're just people. What am I taking pictures for? So I started taking pictures little by little. 
I'm not a reporter. I like standing on the pulpit, standing uh, in the pulpit and bring the truth to the people who are willing to hear the truth. But these people, they begged me to come back as soon as possible, telling me that Europe is closed, that Egypt is open, which was a little bit uh, uh, a joke uh, to me. Thank you so much for your prayers and uh, for, uh, I promised them that I will come back very soon. I, I see that God is doing something there in Egypt, no doubt about it. He's doing something very unique. And they, they themselves identify that to be true. And that's why they have been, in fact, one, they ask me many times, what's your hope for our nation? What do you want to do? What do you want your ministry to do here in the land for the nation? They saw that I brought to them truth nothing but truth, undiluted, and they embraced it wholeheartedly. Well, so much for the report for now. As we shift gear uh, to our study, The Heroes of Faith, part five. Father God, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for your love, for your kindness, Thank you because you have a plan, unshakable plan that no man can tamper with. Thank you because your plan is running its course, full force, and no one is stopping it. Thank you because we are part of this plan by divine design. Thank you for your people all over the world. Thank you for granting me safe travels to Dubai and Egypt. And thank you for ministering to the people, both in hotels, outside hotels, at the airport, wherever you created opportunity. And thank you for the people who prayed for me, who joined me in the trip through prayer. Uh, and I pray as we study this hour that you will open our own eyes. And by so doing, edify us through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. It is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of faith. We've been dealing or studying the heroes of faith, which is very uh, essential or very faith. If we are to line with God, if we are to worship him, as he desires we worship him, we must approach him by means of faith. As he tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to not only please him, but to worship him. Without faith, it is impossible to both please and worship him. So faith is essential. It's not a blind faith. I'm not talking about blind faith. Rather, I'm talking about faith that is embedded in the truth that you already received. The truth about God. The heroes of faith. We have been going through the heroes of faith. We've gone through Abraham, through Joseph. We've seen how this man who stood in the, when all us were against them, how they conquered, not by using any ammunition, rather by using faith, applying faith, they were able to conquer. Faith is so important. Faith is so important. I can't express, I can't express this enough. And that's what the author is trying to bring to the people who we are about to bail out. Uh, some have already bailed out from their worship of God. The Christians who are already growing cold. And the author is trying to recharge them by bringing along a list of heroes, heroes of faith. 
some of these heroes of faith, he gave them paragraphs. Some he gave one paragraph, two paragraphs, three paragraphs, and some he just mentioned them in going, uh, mentioned Daniel in going. He never gave Daniel uh, time like he gave to Joseph or Moses. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those who quenched fire. Uh, he just mentioned the what happened with these people, all because of faith. Let us not undervalue faith. Let us, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, walk by faith, live by faith. And so tonight we pick up with the faith of Moses. The faith of Moses. Hebrews 11, 23 through 28. So turn with me in your Bible. And let's just uh, take a look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Pause for a moment. The faith of Moses began with the faith of his parents. His parents, he said parents here, that means the, the mom and the father, they were involved in the hiding of Moses in the in river, in the river. And of course, uh, I, uh, my hotel was just at the back of the river that they, we are talking about here. By faith, Moses, when he was born, what was going on at this time? The Pharaoh who was at the time, the Bible didn't tell us which Pharaoh and the history hasn't been able to, to, to Satisfy which Pharaoh was, there had been a, little, a lot of uh, debates and uh, speculations, which Pharaoh was at the time when Moses was born. But the point, that's not important. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit would have put it down for us. The, that particular Pharaoh is not important. What was important was the, the that particular Pharaoh has saw how Israel was prospering, how they were multiplying in number. In order to, he, he saw them as a threat. In order to minimize that threat, he gave an edict to kill every boy that was born. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 1. Verses 15 through 21. Exodus 1, 15 through 21. Let's have the context of what happened during this time. Exodus 1, 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, even though I don't, I don't have to expand on this passage, but pay attention to see, uh, let's see how God deals with people one of whom was named Shipra and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. See, the command here is once the baby is coming out and you see it's a, a son, is a boy, kill that boy, strangle that boy before he comes out of the womb. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. You see, the midwife, two edicts, divine and human. At this point, there was no one teaching them. It was the, it was by tradition, 
They didn't have priests. They didn't have pastors. But the little they had by tradition, what I mean by tradition, Abraham passed to Isaac. Isaac passed to Jacob. Jacob passed to the 12 tribes that have made up Israel. Uh, tradition, they were all passing the information they received, either angelic teaching or angelic revelation. So that's how they come to know about this God of Israel. So from what they knew about God, they feared God more than they feared man. That too was an act of faith, a God that they have not seen, they haven't touched, but they knew that this God was real. It was real to Abraham. It was real to Isaac. It was real to Jacob. And so they feared him and they did not obey the command of the king. Verse 18, so the king of Egypt Verse 17, rather. But the Midwest feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys leave. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys leave? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and they give birth before the midwife can get to them. Of course, we know that is a, a lie, but the point taken. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. God was good to the midwives. Don't, don't forget that. When you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, has a sense of fear in you about God, count on one thing, God will be good to you, regardless of what. If you, uh, you see, one thing here about this woman, uh, they didn't see any, they didn't, there was no vision, no dream. God didn't tell them anything. It was just that act of conscience they have had from this oral tradition about God that instilled in them the fear of this mighty God. At this point, God had not even demonstrated his power in Egypt yet, as he did. Uh, when Moses will be used to bring about the revelation of the Almighty, when he will perform 10 great miracles in Egypt. By this time, they have not had any power identified about this God. And yet, these women feared God. By fearing God, they, they, by this time, they have come to know that Israel was a peculiar people, was a peculiar people. The history alone would have given them chills all over them to know that Abraham, his journey, all the way, how they made it to Egypt, and Joseph himself being sold and become prime minister, oh, they have stories to tell enough to be able to give them confidence in this God. And so God blessed them. God blessed them. God was good. Verse 20, not all, not, that's not all, verse 21. And it came about because the Midwest feared God that he established households for them. You got that? No one who ever serves God that goes empty-handed in this life. No one, no human being on this planet Earth that gives his or her life to honoring God that goes empty handed. If that's all you learn tonight, you can close your note and turn off and say that you've learned the lesson for tonight. No one, including you, including me. And this God hasn't changed. We are the ones that change, not God. God doesn't change, not a bit. Malachi 3.6 says it so clearly. I am the same, I change not. We are the changeable ones, not God. If we are just to the justice of God, his justice will align with us in a way that 
it will stagger our imagination. Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile and every daughter you are to keep alive. That is the context of what happened in verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. The, 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 the beautiful dear means an unusual. They saw some kind of an unusual. There was some there was something unusual about his beauty. Moses was handsome, beyond handsome, uh, handsomeness. What they saw here was, I believe, by divine providence, they must have gotten a sense that this child must have something to do for God. It wasn't written. As you and I, often we have by prompting of the spirit or by something you just know within yourself that there's something about some uh, either uh, this person or that person. By divine providence, I believe, who had it, they had a sense that this child was an unusual child. And so they went extra mile to hide a child they do in, in, in the Nile River. We know the, the author, the author here didn't go through the stories of how uh, Pharaoh's daughter came and uh, found the baby and all those things. He didn't, he just cut off those, those uh, we all know those, the rest of the story. But his emphasis, his emphasis here was faith. He was working on faith. Um, so now he picked up from Moses, he just cut off the rest of all the things that Moses did, even when Moses grew, how Moses fought and they killed the Egyptian, all those things. No, he just cut off all those things and went straight to what happened when Moses was grown up. Uh, grown up here uh, is believed that by this time, Moses must have been about 40 years old or so. So he wasn't a, a young boy, like uh, he was a matured man uh, to the point that he knew what he was doing. He knew left and right, left from right. So by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter. You may not un fully understand what this meant. He refused. This was a person with a feature on a platter. This was a man who has seen his, Egypt in his, in his, as a wealthy nation, prosperous nation. This is a man, or this was a man who could be sitting on the throne after that Pharaoh had gone. He was, he was being adopted as an adopted child, adopted son. His is to take the throne after the Pharaoh was gone. That was, that's, that's, for me, that's fame in front of him. Being one of the, at this time, Egypt, well, you can say Egypt was one of the, if not the, the, the greatest empire on earth. You can uh, put them on the line of great empires. They, 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 to sit on the throne. It's like in America here, uh, you see, so you also saw what happened uh, in the last two campaigns and two elections. People do all kinds of things to sit on that throne as president of the United States of America. Just the name United States of America kind of make your head blow, blow up and you want to be the president. And some people we know wanting to be president not because they want to make money. Uh, it has nothing to do with money, but it has to do with fame being identified. 
Uh, by the way, I'm, uh, I am the president, or I was the president of the United States, the greatest country on earth. Uh, so Moses had that opportunity to be the president, the, to be the, the king, the pharaoh that will sit on the entire nation, that will command the whole nation, both the wealth and everything. So I want you to be thinking about that as we see Moses take action. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused. Completely, totally, utterly, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, I don't want to do any, I don't want anything to do with this privilege. A privilege has been set in front of him. And he knew that silver and gold, everything had been said. He would lack nothing. He would not, he would lack nothing. Some of us, we, we always like to ra rationalize, don't we? Let me see, show you how we could rationalize this. One of the ways we could rationalize is by saying, well, this is a great opportunity. If I become the king, the pharaoh of this nation, I am going to make sure that the Israelites are well taken care of or are well taken care of. If I become the king, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to pass laws to favor them forever. We can rationalize that. Do you rationalize? Do you know when to draw the line as a believer and not and, and resist the temptation to rationalize your way out. We always find ways of find how we can rationalize things and make up things that are not there. And why we are chasing the wind. And that's one thing. See, when we all look at the lives of the people in the past whom the Lord used and blessed in a mighty way, we need to study their, their lives and just study Examine how they live their own lives in the light of what they had at that time. For example, Abraham. Abraham was offered. He was offered wealth by the king. He, Abraham said, nope. I don't, want, I don't want your wealth. And he gave reason. I don't want, when I am Abraham is wealthy. I don't want you to say I have made Abraham wealthy. He refused to take the wealth that was offered him. And some of us would have said, oh, praise God. This is a mighty God. Is a, we give God so many names. El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh. We, we come up with names to show how God has blessed us. But Abraham thought his way through and saw the shrewd that might come through it, and he turned it off, turned it down. Of course, God blessed him tremendously. We should be careful as believers to know when we are compromising. The devil is so shrewd and so cunning, he knows how to trap us and get us to rationalize our way out and find out losing what we or to have gained. In verse 25, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. It's not that Moses was living in sin in Egypt, but what he saw by divine providence as well, he saw he has, by this time, his heritage has been made known to him. He knew where he was coming from, where he came from was not hidden, that he was a Hebrew. And so he has seen the difference between the children of God and what was in the palace. In the palace, they, they didn't have any sense of God or, or, or the deity that uh, Israel uh, as a nation, or as a group of people at this time, they, hadn't, they haven't been a nation yet, just a, a people group. They didn't align themselves Moses said, no, 
There's a distinction between here. What I see on this left hand is different from what I see on this right hand side. What I see on this left hand is just pleasure without God, without fear of God. Pleasure, 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 pleasure. I don't want to do anything with this pleasure, these tangible things. He said, nope, I'm not going to identify myself. Considering, verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. For he was looking to the reward. Pause for a moment. What is it as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? This is a Bible class. This is in the, I'm not preaching. Uh, if I want to preach, <laughs> I know where to go and preach. And I'll be shouting and yelling. Uh, but I'm teaching. In teaching, you give people time to reflect. You give people time to connect. Is there anything in your life that you are looking and you are holding tight and you're not willing to give in exchange of something you haven't seen. When I was studying this uh, passage, going through it again after I came back, see, I came back uh, this uh, afternoon. I didn't want to sleep. One, if I sleep, uh, that will be the end of Bible class, probably. So I said, uh, let me just stay awake. And uh, thank God he gave me that strength to stay awake. Uh, ordinarily, uh, the, this time is, uh, what time? What time is it? Uh, almost uh, 3 o'clock or so in Egypt, 3 a.m. So God has given me the strength. I asked for strength. He did. So I'm still awake. When I was going through this and this evening, When I read this passage, the one that I have watched, I don't know, I'm sure some of you have watched this uh, show that people do, and, uh, one of the, the latest, the, the first one that everybody tuned in, even all over the world, was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Everybody wanted that uh, show. Uh, people just tuned in, curious, uh, where the moderator will ask question. Uh, if you can give answer to that question, good questions, history, geography, science, whatever, uh, you make more, they give you money for answering that question correctly. If you lose next question, you lose the money, it's a certain amount of money based on what you have accumulated. I have one time watched one person, he Remember the, the 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 desire is to be a millionaire. Maybe some people actually made a million, their first million. So automatically they are now called or uh, they were called millionaires for making that million. One person made five hundred thousand dollars. He's been answering question, answering question correctly, correctly. He made five hundred thousand dollars. And the next question will double that 500,000 and you become a millionaire. And the moderator gave me a, a, an option. Walk away with this 500,000 and not answer that question, the following question, you don't know what it is. And the, you can just go home with that 500,000. Or if you miss answering that question, you lose the 500,000. This young man scratched his head scratch his head and said, I'm going to go for the one million. And they asked him, and he was asked, given the question for the one that will get him to one million, he got it wrong. He lost half a million dollars. I don't know how he slept. But that was, for me, that was a lot of money. Half a million dollars gone. Perhaps somebody that was working in McDonald's or somewhere. Ah. 
But this isn't what I'm talking about here. That's what I would call blind faith. But this one is not blind faith. Moses had so much in the palace. He has so much in the palace. And he was willing to forgo all these things to pursue something he hasn't seen. Something he hasn't even heard the voice of God. He hasn't even had any encounter with God. All the encounter Moses had was oral tradition. That was it. Put yourself in Moses' shoes right now. For you and I, we have Bible. We have the canon of scripture completed from Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation. We have history of those God has dealt with throughout human history, starting from Adam. At this time, they didn't have any page. Moses did not, Moses himself didn't have any page of the Bible. But you and I, we have 66 books of the Bible completed, binded for us to use in different languages. These people will judge us. No doubt about it. They will stand before the Bema seat and judge us. For we have more than they did. And yet, with the little they had, God shone through their lives. But you and I, we have so much. So much. And we are wondering like those who have nothing. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, but you do. They didn't have the indwelling of God himself, but you do. The Son of God didn't indwell any of them, but we do today. No wonder why Jesus himself said, to whom much is given, much will be what? You get that right, required. Much has been given to us. Moses was now, he refused what was in front of him. He refused the pleasures the tangible pleasures. He knew that these pleasures, even if they lasted for his whole lifetime, were still temporary. The, the pleasure you may have may last as long as you live on this planet Earth. 50 years, 60 years, 100 years, and that pleasure continues to last with you. But when you, when you die, the pleasure ends. It's not trans, trans, transported into eternity. For Moses, Moses didn't, he cared less. He took it behind his back. He backed out. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, which means an opportunity to be king. Choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He rather identified with people who were poor, slaves. Moses at this time wasn't slave anymore. Rather, he chose to be slaves, to be identified with people who were slaves. That's where he had his uh, outing. His, uh, whenever you find Moses, Moses was with this group. Instead of identifying himself with where he belonged by adoption. Why did he do that? The author tells them in verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Considering, considering the suffering, the distress, sharing in the distress of Christ to be more impressive than what he would gain from Egypt. Here, Moses at this time didn't know much about Christ. But yet, when he wrote, later on, when he wrote Hebrew, when he wrote in first, when he wrote, in fact, when Paul wrote in First Corinthians 10, he mentioned that Jesus followed them. Turn to First Corinthians chapter 10. Jesus has been like, like we have taught 
in our previous teaching, turn to 1 Corinthians 10, you will see Jesus mentioned with Israel. For I do not want you to, verse 1, to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers, talking about the Israelites, we are all under the cloud and, on, and all pass through the sea, talking about the Red Sea with Moses. And all we are baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, and all ate the same spiritual food, that is the manna. And, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. You see, Christ has a history. His history didn't start in New Testament. He was the I am who introduced himself to Moses, the Jehovah God who has no beginning and no ending. He followed them. Uh, and Isaiah 63 verse nine tells us, uh, Isaiah 63 nine tells us that verse 9, in, in all the affliction or distress, he was afflicted or distressed. He here is Jehovah God, the same one who followed them. In all the affliction, he was afflicted or distressed. And that should teach you something, or that should just bring a, a light to you. I don't know what you are going through as a believer. I don't know. But one thing you should know is that it, Jehovah God shares your distress. Our Lord Jesus Christ shares your distress. He was called a man of sorrow in Isaiah 53. He's a man of sorrow. There is no nothing in your life as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that he's not identified with. The he author of Hebrew, Hebrews tells us that's why he had to be a man. If he was an angel, angelic being, he wouldn't know what we are going through as humans. So God had to make him human so that he'd be identified with us. When you are coughing, he has coughed. When you are sweating, he has sweat. When you are bleeding, he has bled. Whenever you are going through as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, remember, has gone through it all. He has shared in your distress and continue to share in your distress. And that's why he said in, in his priesthood, he can sympathize with us. He can be a, a, a good sympathizer because he has been through what we are going through and even far more than what you and I are going through. And so, again, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Get this, for he was looking to the reward. He was looking to the reward. There is something it takes tremendous faith. It takes tremendous faith. When I when I saw this, I don't know, honestly speaking, it, whatever it, it just struck me, whether it, it struck me as a joke or not a joke, I don't know. But from what I hear or I, I heard people say when I was in Egypt, I kind of joke with myself. Just a joke without what I don't know what it is. In fact, one woman said to me, I believe God has something for you in Egypt. Maybe God will use you to save our people or do some kind. That's the way she said it. I, when she after I left her, I said to myself, that's a joke. But let's, let's assume that's not a joke. 3,500 years ago, God brought Moses into Egypt. Would he be bringing another Moses into Egypt 3,500 years later? 
<laughs> that's, that's what I call that's a joke. But whatever it is, there was a pulling from every corner that said, Moses, come back, come back, come back. Come, 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 we need you. This country needs you. In fact, my host said, when he took me to the airport, I told him, at least I will not be more than two more years before I come back. He said, <laughs> maximum six months. And there is urge within me to keep going back. And whenever I have that kind of sense or have that urge within me, impressed by the spirit, I know there's something God is doing, but I don't know what it is. I I'm not going to predict. I'm not going to tell you this is what God is doing, but I'm just telling you how I am feeling. There's an urge. I've been to almost 100 countries all over the world. And uh, I have not been to any country that doesn't want me to come back. That's not uh, a praise or a, uh, exaggeration. It, what, what do I get out of it? If you say praise, praise myself or what? But uh, the point I want to make is this. Assuming that I am answering this cause, please come, come back, come back from these 100 countries. There's just no way, it's humanly impossible for me to visit 100 countries in one year. It's not possible. I think I will die on the plane. It's just not possible. The most I can go, maybe, uh, if I give them time, I may say, okay, in the next three or four years, I will visit you. In the next five years, I will visit you. Not one, not every year. But to me, for me to have gone to a country, apart from this COVID, in fact, it was the last visit that I had with them before the COVID erupted. In fact, I was, we were joking, when I was in Egypt, that's when the, in March of 2020, when this was just spreading like wildfire. Uh, that was when I left them, when I left Egypt, the last flight I left, I left on Tuesday uh, and no more flights going to Dubai. All flight was canceled, no more flight. Uh, Dubai said no more flight coming from Egypt. And funny again enough, after one week of conference in Dubai, when I left Dubai, that Tuesday, Wednesday, flight was grounded. I think God did me a favor by rescuing me before the grounding of, in fact, for three months, there was no flight from Dubai to USA. And so that was when this COVID was just uh, bloom, bloom, blooming everywhere, capturing every nation. And we were joking in Egypt. In fact, my translator, uh, sometimes he will, uh, he will say, it's a kind of a joke so that I, I wouldn't come close to him because he may have COVID. But that's just a joke. But now, now not a joke anymore. Uh, it has become a reality. And so there is a pressure within me to go back. In fact, if possible, I may even go back before the year runs out because the need is there, the cry is there, and I can see a blinking hope for that nation. I don't know what God is doing. God always does things. Who knows? Every few thousand years, he will do something. I don't know. And let's not speculate. Don't, don't even draw a line between my statement. Verse 26, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. What is it in your life right now that you are considering to be more valuable than what God will offer you? Can you think of one thing as a believer? What is it that if you are asked to give up right now for your love for Christ, you hang, hang on to it for a while? What is it? Moses. He saw none of us, none of us here listening to, the, to me this night 
none of us has the opportunity Moses had. None, zero. Not in wealth. None of us will even come close to the opportunity that Moses had. One thing is one thing to give up, give up your your. So you are a mediocre job for the Lord. So you're giving everything up for the Lord. Mediocre job or job that you pay pays you not too much. You say give it up for the Lord. It's one thing. But there's another thing to give up palace for the Lord. That's exactly what Moses did. Moses gave up palace, gave up throne, and pursue the invisible Christ. How many of us will do that right now? You don't wait until you are until you are Moses or you right now you have that opportunity as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. How serious? How ser let me ask you again, how serious are you with your spiritual life? Let's start there. How serious are you? Are there things, are there pleasures in your life? Are there things you consider pleasures and you are difficult to give them up for the sake of Christ? If, if they are, you just fail the test. Moses had these things, whatever you, you call them, mixture of, call them wine, call them women, men, whatever you call them and bonded them and call them pleasure. Moses had them in front of him. They would have women lined up, dancing, that's part of pleasure. They will have everything, party going on all night long. They had everything they needed. Moses would have inherited all these things. He walked away, pursuing the invisible, in pursuing Christ. Verse 6 again in 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is, look at this, a rewarder of those who seek him. No one ever seeks God and goes empty-handed. Zero. If you wanna, if you wanna enrich your life, it's not too late. If you wanna enrich your life as a believer, begin tonight. When you go tonight after this Bible class, make a decision and say, from tonight, from this night forward, I'm going to condition my life to seek after God. If you say that from the bottom of your heart and you mean it, I guarantee you one thing, you will not go empty handed in this life. Not what, not if you go empty handed, I don't need to read about, I don't need to preach about this Bible anymore. It's, the Bible becomes useless. Because Jesus said that not a single word from this Bible will go without being fulfilled. Consider 2 Chronicles 69. The eyes of the Lord run through and fro. He's looking to, he's seeking anyone whose heart is committed, dedicated, to him, that passage says, when he sees that individual, he will support any person. There are many ways God will support you in this life. If you, as a believer, would do what the people of the past did, they committed to God. What? I don't know. I can't. I, 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 I really, if honestly speaking, I don't know what people, what is preventing them from throwing their, their lives in the hands of God and say, God, here I am. I want to live for you. Here I am. I don't want a one foot on outside, one foot inside kind of business. God doesn't want that kind of business either. But Moses, I, I, I hope to meet him in heaven. Moses threw away abandoned, walked away from this. Verse 27, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, 
for he endured as seen him who is unseen. And one thing is to see, and one thing is to be able. Moses saw the tangible. He saw, he saw the magnificent. He saw the palace. He saw everything. Egypt, well, Egypt is a very, it's a, a magnificent country. It's a great country. Still is. Their capital, Cairo. When you if look at Cairo, Cairo is, uh, is very something unique about that uh, city where I was uh, just yesterday. Moses walked away from all these things. He pursued the invisible. It can only take faith to, to pursue something that you haven't seen or can touch. By faith, he pursued God. He pursued our Savior, Jesus Christ. Not by faith, he kept, verse 28, by faith, he kept Passover and the sprinkle of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn might not touch them by faith. Let's go back to that faith pursuing the invisible. By faith, Moses pursued the invisible. What does it mean? It means that he hasn't seen it, he hasn't touched it, but he knew it was real. Have you seen God? Have you touched him? But you know, you and I know that God is real. Based on the information we have, David came to the conclusion only a fool can say that there is no God. I have, I'm sure you have some kind of divine encounter with God. I have had divine encounter with God so many times in my life to the conclusion that I have to be, a, I have to be foolish to deny that there is God. God is real. It was real to Moses, even though he didn't see him. That's why he pursued him. He pursued him knowing that one day this God will make himself known to him. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it will be opened. And so did Moses. It didn't take long. In Midian, he left Egypt, wandered in the desert until he found himself in media. In media, and there in the media, and he is, he, he Moses lived not knowing what would be the end result of his life. But he didn't look back. He never regretted having left Egypt. He just believed if one day that God would do, use him, or one day the plan of God will come to fruition in his life. In the meantime, just a shepherd, helping his in-law. By this time, Moses had gotten a wife, helping his uh, in-law, raise cattle, raise whatever was necessary, taking it one day at a time. And God was watching him develop to the point that when the time came, Moses met the one he was seeking to meet. Draw near to God, James 4, 8, and he will draw near to you. You cannot seek God in this life and not find him. It's not possible. It may take years. God didn't tell you how long it would take for you to find him in a, in, in a more real sense. As, as, as our Lord Jesus Christ told us in John, John the Gospel of John, that when you and I obey God, which is equivalent to love him, that he will make his home in us. He will reveal himself in a way that he doesn't reveal to other people, though they are Christians as well. The invisible God. Now our problem, as I close tonight, our problem in Christianity is we don't have faith. We, often we think we do have faith. We don't really have faith. Faith grows 
And by the way, faith grows. Don't pray that God will just give you a faith like a mega faith, and then you have mega faith. No, it grows. Paul tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Increase our faith was a prayer. Increase our faith. Faith does grow. The more you understand the word of God, the more you expose yourself to the teaching of the word of God, the more you get to know God. Abraham's faith grew. At, at, at first, as a baby believer, he feared for his life. But as he grew in, in the Lord, his faith multiplied to the point that when he was tested, he passed with flying colors the ultimate taste of his life. Don't let this fleeting draw you out from where God wants you to be a place where you receive maximum blessing that will stagger your imagination in this life. It's not worth it. These fleeting pleasures, they don't worth it. They go, they come as they go. Uh, it just it's like a like the it's, it glitters, but they're not gold. As 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 one says, not all that glitters is gold. They look them, they glitter, but they are not gold. Moses seek the invisible. Uh, the the problem is that we have not seen what we ought to see. That's only that's the problem with us. We haven't seen what we should see as Christians. Honestly speaking, majority of Christians have not seen what they ought to see as Christians. I'm talking about with their spiritual eyes, not these naked eyes. With these naked eyes, we see destruction. Everything we see here with these naked eyes are all destruction. With the spiritual eyes, that's why when Paul prayed for the Ephesians, when he prayed for the Ephesians, the first prayer he prayed for them, after being with them for three years, could you imagine? the great teacher like the Apostle Paul, the great apostle to be in the church for three years as their resident pastor. Paul was an evangelist, he was an apostle, he was a pastor, you just name it. But God kept him in Ephesus for three years. And after three years, he left them and they went back sleeping, sleeping giants. And that's why he, he told them in Ephesians chapter five, verse 14, wake up. Wake up, you sleepers. They were sleeping giants. And in fact, the first prayer he prayed for them wasn't prosperity, wasn't that God would keep them from, from persecution. The first prayer he prayed for them, do you know what he prayed for them for? Oh, yeah. That their eyes might be opened, that their eyes might be enlightened. The reason why you see pastors make fun of Christianity their eyes are not open. The reason why you see Christians wonder as if they can differentiate them from unbelievers, the reason, it's only one reason, their eyes are not open. They, they come to church, they sing choirs, they do all kinds of things, but their eyes are not open. You can be a Christian for 40 years, your eyes still not open. And that's why Paul prayed that their eyes might be open so that they may be able to see the width, the length, the height, of this magnificent plan that God has for us. The day your eyes are opened, and that's the prayer you need to pray. God, open my eyes to see what you want me to see in this Christianity, in this Christian work. The day your eyes are, are opened, everything will be by God. You put everything behind you and seek God with all your heart. And so by faith, they offered, the, it's, it's faith that took them to take the blood and put on the doorpost, the blood of the lamp, by putting their faith in the blood of the lamp, which is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. By putting that, actually, they were putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith, and that faith saved them. And those who did not go along with the faith of Moses were destroyed by faith. That challenge is for all of us. Let us live by faith, not by sight. If you walk by sight, you miss the blessings of time. Father God, thank you so much for your love, for your kindness, for your mercies, 
Thank you for the word preserved. Thank you for enlightening us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we realize that we have been sandwiched between two pressures, divine and satanic pressures. And Father, we also know that this is a talk of war. Satan wants to win, the spirit wants to win. And we are caught up in the center of this battle. It is my humble prayer that you will guide us. You will open our eyes indeed as Paul prayed for the Ephesians that we may see what we need to see as believers, knowing that everything that is here is temporary, cause us to pursue with all alacrity, to pursue with all might, to pursue as Moses did, as we do by faith, cause us to be blessed beyond measure. I pray, Father God, for this nation. We are lacking behind, seriously. I pray that there will be a great awakening that you will sweep the, that the, the flame of revival will engulf this nation like in the time of the old, like in the time of the great awakening that one, one more time that this nation will see such great awakening, that believers, churches will be awakened to the truth that we have in front of us. Our prayer also, God, not only in America, but across the globe, that this time of pandemic, that you use it to draw us to you. Pray for Egypt, as there's a blinking of light and hope in that nation. I pray that uh, you would uh, enrich them, satisfy them. As you say that those who hunger for righteousness, that they will be satisfied. May you satisfy their hunger one way or the other. Thank you so much for those who tuned in tonight. Bless each and every one of us. Uh, give us good night rest. And in the morning, wake us up. Keep us intact. Draw us close to you. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Keep us loving you. Keep us yearning for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us away from this coronavirus or this disease. Continue to shatter your people. And this is my prayer. Again, thank you so much for granting me safe travels and for bringing me back to rejoin with uh, my people, your people, and uh, continue to bless us as we live out our lives here on earth. This is my prayer until we meet again in Christ's name.